one question becomes inevitable at this point. If those were military drones and not regular airliners, what happened to the passengers? With certainty, no one can answer this question. One thing we do know, however, the CIA has been developing plans for covert operations that involve the in-flight swapping of commercial airliners with military drones since the 1960s. One such plan was called Operation Northwoods, and it detailed how to replace a civil airliner with a military drone in mid-air, unbeknownst to the air traffic controllers. After the swap, the airliner would be landed in a military base. The drone would continue to fly, appearing on radar as the original plane, and would be remotely guided all the way into the target. We don't know whether this is the actual end the passengers met, but one thing we can say for sure those who called their relatives from their cell phones could not have placed those calls from the airplanes in flight. Minutes after the fourth plane had crashed in Pennsylvania, news was already circulating that several passengers had made calls with their cell phones from the hijacked airplanes. We are being hijacked. We are being hijacked. Those frightening words were uttered by a passenger aboard United Flight 93 who was able to call emergency personnel on his cell phone before the plane crashed in western Pennsylvania. And tonight we're getting reports of cell phone calls from at least three of those four flights. On the second flight that came out of Boston, that was the second flight of the day and also went into one of the Twin Towers of the World Trade Center, there was a businessman who got off two cell phone calls uh, to his father. The CNN commentator Barbara Olson, wife of U.S. Solicitor General Very Ted Olson. She reportedly called her husband twice on a mobile phone to tell him her plane was being hijacked. The problem is that in 2001, it was practically impossible to make a call with a cell phone from an airplane at cruising altitudes. The whole idea behind cellular phones is that they use low power transmitters, both to keep the cost of the units down and to preserve battery life. It is up to the receiving towers on the ground to pick up and boost their signal before they route it through the system. It is commonly thought that beyond 10,000 feet in altitude, most cell phones become useless. Passenger planes normally cruise at 30,000 feet and beyond. The editors of Popular Mechanics, however, maintain that cell phones do work from cruising airplanes, even at maximum altitudes. David Dunbar. With regard to the cell phones, we did what any reporter would do. We talked to experts in the field, and in fact, cell phones do work at that altitude, up to 35,000 feet and higher. And um, in 2001? In 2001, and it might be instructive for you to talk to some of the cell phone experts. Instead of talking to experts, Japanese television decided to take matters into their own hands. In 2003, they conducted an on-camera experiment near Ontario, Canada to verify the actual reach of cell phones from different altitudes. The cellular phone system used in the experiment in Canada is the one used in the United States. Three cell phones, each from different telephone companies, were used. The experiment begins at a thousand feet. Hello? Hello, I'm calling from the cell phone A. What's up? What's happening for you? Sounds okay? The results were the same with the other two. Next, we went up to 4,000 feet. Then. No, not on Not on me. Company B's phone stopped working at 4,000 feet. And when the aircraft rose to 6,000 feet, Company A's phone also became useless. At 8,000 feet, none of the three cell phones worked anymore. No service on A, no service on B, no service on C. In other words, at an altitude of 35,000 feet, cell phones would have been totally useless. There is another problem besides altitude that makes calling from a cell phone unthinkable from a cruising airplane, and that is speed. Calling from an aircraft with a cell phone would be like calling from a car traveling at 500 miles per hour. The connection would continuously need to be transferred from one receiving station to the next, and then to the next, and again to the next. The transfer procedure between two receiving stations is called handoff, and it relies on continuous triangulations between the receiving towers in order to establish the exact position of the caller. As the mobile unit approaches the handoff zone, the first tower senses the weakening of the signal and prepares to transfer the call to the second. When the second tower senses the signal is strong enough to take over, the handoff procedure is initiated. If everything goes well, the call is rerouted into the system by the new receiving station. 
but the speed by which an airplane approaches and crosses over the handoff zone is so high that the towers wouldn't have the time to complete the handoff procedure. The call would be dropped and the person would need to dial the number from scratch. If one considers the altitude and the speed problems combined, it should be clear that the chances of having an actual conversation with a cell phone from a cruising airplane are practically nil. Even after 2001, both altitude and speed problems remain. In 2005, the Washington Post wrote, most cell phones can't reach a station from beyond 10,000 feet. Another technical hurdle is to find a way that cell phone calls would be handed off from one cell tower to another on the ground when an aircraft is traveling at 500 miles an hour. And even 10 years after 9-11, people who try to use their cell phone from cruising altitudes are bound to get the same results. Once it became clear that the passengers could not have placed their calls from the cell phones on the airplanes, the official narrative on this issue became more and more ambiguous and non-committal. Theodore Olson, who had initially told the press he had received two cell phone calls from his wife Barbara, changed his story to calls made from an air phone. And by the time the 9-11 Commission published their final report, only one mention on the cell phone calls remained. Shortly thereafter, wrote the commission, passengers and flight crew began a series of calls from GTA air phones and cellular phones. No indication on which calls were made from cell phones and which ones with air phones was given. The authorities from the Masawi trial also avoided being too specific on the origin of the calls. Within the official documentation, they released this flash animation, which contains all the basic information on the four hijacked airplanes. By clicking on any of the flights, one can view the passengers list. By clicking on the telephone icon at the bottom, the passengers who have made phone calls are highlighted. And by clicking on any of the passengers' names, the list of the calls they have made is displayed. Each of the calls lists the exact time it was placed, the duration, the initial part of the number dialed, and the name of the person receiving the call. But the number from which the phone call was placed is missing. The only information available is the location on the plane the calls were presumably made from, row 30 in this case. It's as if the authorities were trying to suggest that the calls were made from air phones without having to put it down on paper. Only in two cases did the authorities openly state that a cell phone was used. One is the call allegedly placed to 911 by a passenger who had locked himself in a lavatory where air phones are not available. The second is a call placed by flight attendant C.C. Lyles to her husband, who later described his surprise in receiving a call from her cell phone in a television interview. Once the phone got disconnected, then I sat up in the bed like, it was like I just woke up. I'm like, did, was that a real call? So I looked at the caller ID and noticed that it was a call and it was from her cell phone. And I'm like, okay, wait a minute. How, how can she call me from on the plane? from a cell phone because cell phones don't work on a plane. That's what I'm thinking. As only these two phone calls were admitted by the authorities, the debunkers have universally adopted the only two cell phone calls made position. Le telefonate non sono state fatte con il cellulare, sono state fatte con gli airphone. In soli due casi è stato usato un cellulare, quindi quelle due telefonate brevissime frammentarie sono state fatte quando l'aereo era una quota perfettamente compatibile con la rete cellulare americana. But one thing is the number of cell phone calls admitted to. Another is the number of calls that were actually made. In the days following 9-11, the FBI interviewed the various people who had received a phone call from their relatives on the planes. And their reports tell a different story. One of the reports reads, starting at approximately 6.30 Pacific Standard Time, which is 9.30 New York time, Dina Burnett received a series from three to five cellular phone calls from her husband, Thomas Burnett. Burnett was able to determine her husband was using his own cellular phone because the caller ID showed his number. Only one of the calls did not show the caller ID as she was on the line with another call. According to the official documentation, Thomas Burnett made a total of three calls, one at 9.30, one at 9.37, and one at 9.44. This means that at least two of these calls, if not all three, were made from Burnett's cellular phone. At 9.30, the plane was flying at 32,000 feet and climbing. At 9.37, it had reached 36,000 feet and was still climbing. At 9.44, it had descended to 22,000 feet, while it accelerated until reaching a ground speed of almost 400 miles per hour. None of these calls seems to have been possible with a cell phone from that airplane. 
According to another report, United 93 passenger Jeremy Glick saw hijackers on the plane, used a cell phone and called Makeley, his stepmother, to report the hijacking. He then asked to talk to his wife, Lisbeth. And, uh, and he was on the phone and he had told me um, that his plane had been hijacked. According to the FBI, Glick's wife, Lisbeth, could not hear any unusual sounds in the background of the call and the connection was extremely clear, as if he was calling from the next room. Cell phone communication was lost at 9.55. Glick placed the call at 9.37, which means the communication lasted uninterrupted for 18 minutes while the plane was flying between 39,000 and 10,000 feet at an average speed of almost 400 miles per hour. Only a miracle could have kept that connection open for all that time had the call truly been placed from the airplane in flight. Lauren Grancolas possessed a cellular phone and is believed to have allowed another passenger, Honor Wainio, to use the cellular phone. Wainio placed one call to her parents at 9.53, when the plane was at about 10,000 feet, traveling close to 400 miles per hour. Elsa Strong received a cell phone call from her sister, Lisa Gronland, a passenger on United 93. Gronland made the call to her sister at 9.46, when the plane was at 17,000 feet and traveling at almost 400 miles per hour. Marion Britton was also a passenger on United 93. Britton's live-in boyfriend received a cellular phone call from Britton during the hijacking. Britton told Fiamano, her boyfriend, that she had borrowed a cell phone from another passenger. Britain's call to Fiumano took place at 9.49, when United 93 was flying beyond 13,000 feet at a speed of 420 miles per hour. Peter Hansen, a passenger on United 175, contacted his mother on cell phone and said the flight had been hijacked. Peter's father, Lee, said that he resisted the temptation to call his son back because he didn't want to place him in more danger by having his cell phone ring on the plane. Peter Hansen called his parents twice, at 8.52 and at 9 a.m. At 8.52, the plane was at 30,000 feet and it was climbing. At 9 o'clock, it was flying at over 18,000 feet in altitude, while it accelerated towards the record-breaking speed of almost 600 miles per hour near sea level. Brian Sweeney was also a passenger on United 175. After learning of the attacks, wrote the FBI, his wife Julie Sweeney returned home to find that her husband had left a message made from his cell phone aboard the plane on their answering machine. Sweeney made the call at 8.58 in between the two Hansen calls when the plane was still at 25,000 feet in altitude. While any one of these phone calls could have momentarily been connected by a set of fortunate coincidences, it should be obvious that all these cell phone calls as a whole could not have been made from the cruising airplanes. Question. Given the known limitations of the cellular phone system in 2001, can you provide any evidence that the cell phone calls made by the passengers reported by the FBI could have been made from the altitudes, at the speeds, and for the durations indicated for each of them? We do know, however, that the calls were made, as no one has ever doubted that the relatives actually received them. This opens the way to a disturbing possibility, which seems to support the in-flight swap hypothesis, that the passengers were forced to call their relatives under duress, pretending to be on the airplane, while in fact they had already been landed in some unknown location. In support of this hypothesis, we have different elements. One is the conversation passenger Todd Beamer had with a GTA airphone operator, Lisa Jefferson, during the hijack of Flight 93. It is through Lisa Jefferson that the whole world learned about the famous call to action, let's roll. When he told the guys, are you ready? I assumed that they were waiting on his cue. Then they responded to him and he said, okay, let's roll. The 9-11 Commission has established that the hijack took place at 9.28. Todd Beamer was connected to Lisa Jefferson at 9.43, some 15 minutes into the hijacking. The FBI report confirms that Jefferson received the call from Beamer at approximately 8.45 Central Time, which is 9.45 Eastern. But the contents of the conversation are strikingly at odds with the official narrative. According to Jefferson, Beamer called to state that the plane was about to be hijacked. He stated that three individuals, two wielding knives, the third with a bomb strapped to his waist with a red belt, were preparing to take control of the flight. Jefferson estimated that she spoke to Beamer for seven minutes before the two hijackers armed with knives entered the cockpit. This places the hijacking at around 9.52, while officially it took place at 9.28. 
this is no small discrepancy. How could Beamer be describing events that are supposed to be happening in front of his eyes when in fact they had already happened half an hour before? How could the terrorists be preparing to take control of the flight at 9.45 when they had already been in the cockpit for more than 15 minutes? The FBI also wrote that Jefferson noted that the call had an unusually low amount of background noise, the same thing Liz Glick had noticed. Furthermore, the records show that Beamer's call lasted roughly one hour and that the line was left open after the crash. We didn't lose a connection, stated Jefferson, because there's a different sound that you use. I never lost connection. It just went silent. Jefferson stayed on the phone, stated the FBI, until she learned Flight 93 had crashed. Question. Since air phones are powered by the same airplane's electrical system, how could the line have remained open for another 45 minutes after the plane had literally disintegrated to the ground in a thousand pieces? All these discrepancies seem to suggest that Beamer was not on the plane, observing real events unfolding, but was describing an imaginary, prescripted situation from a different location. In support of this hypothesis, we also have the dramatic message left by flight attendant Cece Lyles in her husband's answering machine before briefly talking to him on her cell phone. As she herself is suggesting, we should listen very carefully. Tuesday, 9.47 a.m. Hi, baby. I'm, baby, you have to listen to me carefully. I'm on a plane that's been hijacked. I'm on the plane. I'm calling from the plane. I want to tell you I love you. Please tell my children that. We too can notice the absence of the typical background noise heard inside a plane. Um, I don't know what to say. There's three guys they hijacked the plane. I'm trying to be calm. We're After saying goodbye, she seems to fumble with the headset while she whispers a few more words into the mouthpiece. I hope to be able to see your face again, baby. I love you. Bye. End of message. Even by playing the segment several times, it remains difficult to hear anything different from the words, it's a frame. In any case, the problem with the phone calls does not change. The cell phone calls confirmed by the FBI in their reports cannot have been made from the cruising airplanes. Someone has to explain where they came from. <laughs>